recording. Let's begin by uh, uh, taking our prayer. And we all join together even if we're muted. Master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion, in your presence, eternal one, source of strength for us, as you have been for our ancestors, we very humbly acknowledge you. What are we? What is our life that you have done such great kindness to us? Therefore, we place our appeals before you so that you may forgive and absolve us of all our faults and failings. Let our faults never become barriers between us and you. It may be your desire to prepare our hearts to feel awe and love for you. May you listen to these words of ours and may you open our encumbered hearts through the mysteries of your Torah. May this our study be a source of pleasure before your throne of glory, like sweet incense. May you shower down upon us the light of our soul source in all the ways by which we define ourselves. May the sparks of your holy servants through whom you have revealed these words to the world shine and sparkle. May their merit, their ancestors' merit, and the merit of their Torah, their innocence, and their holiness stand for us so as to prevent us from stumbling when we study these words. In their merit, may our eyes be illumined by what we study. As in the saying of the sweet singer of Israel, open my eyes that I may gaze into wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is the eternal who grants wisdom. It is from his mouth that knowledge and understanding issue forth. Na 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 Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 Oh, no, 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 Oh, no, 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 Oh no 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 Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no,
We're on page uh, 259, and uh, we just concluded, we just concluded the, uh, uh, the section uh, that uh, ends with a little gap there, Rabbi Chia's exposition of uh, the mysteries of the Torah. Um, the, the last mystery I claimed was this, this whole, this, you know, this difficult problem that we touch on again and again and again, which is the, the relationship between the holy and the profane, the good and the evil, the godly and the demonic, the relationship between Jacob and Esau, um, and uh, what seems apparent in this world versus what's really true about uh, about the ultimate reality. Um, I mentioned when we first got into the discussion of those last that last paragraph and then a the little last last line um, that the the uh, at first blush the uh, the end of this uh, discussion doesn't quite live up to uh, the hopes that I had of uh, of the whole really the beautiful and deep um, exposition exposition that that uh, for the last page and a half um, was about uh, the depths of the Torah the profundity of the Torah the evolution of the Torah um I think that part of this whole um I mean I don't know if this is a little too uh you know too cute by half or too too uh, uh whatever is too too smart um but the letdown is part of the secret the letdown is part of exactly the topic about how the world itself is not uh, a continuous uh, uh, um, program of, of uh, holiness, divinity, revelation, illumination. Um, the ups and downs are, are united in the process. And in a certain sense, the kind of literary ups and downs of the Zohar are part of this too. Anyway, now we're about to start the uh, the last few lines of uh, on page two fifty nine. We're going back to the first verse of our uh, Torah portion, Toldot, uh, and uh, we'll see that we we we're going to. Go back again to to the context, but uh, um, uh, we we use the uh, the first words of the Torah portion. Toldot the generations, Ela Toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham holidet Yitzchak. These are the generations of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham uh, engendered Isaac. So what's going on? 
Okay, uh, somebody going to read for us, please, this evening. I'll read. Thank you. These are the generations of Isaac, son of Abraham. Rabbi Yossi said, why is son of Abraham mentioned only now and not previously? Because although it is written, God blessed Isaac, his son, now that Abraham has died, his image remains stamped in Isaac. So whoever saw Isaac would say, that's really Abraham, and would attest, Abraham engendered Isaac. Okay, so this is a way of reading the flow of the verse. As I said, the flow of the verse is as we have it at the top of this paragraph and then at the end of the paragraph. These are the generations of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham engendered Isaac. So the uh, verse in the middle comes from a little bit before that. It comes from the previous Torah reading from Chayi Sarah. And it talks about that, uh, and we're going to look at this verse a little bit later. After uh, Abraham's death, God blesses Isaac, his son, his, his, the pronoun referring back to Abraham. But now is the first time where we have it explicit, right? Where Yitzchak is called Ben Avraham. When God talks to Abraham, he calls Isaac, your son, your only one, your beloved one. But, but just this kind of a genealogical statement, Yitzchak, Ben Avraham, Isaac, the son of Abraham, like being called to the Torah, um, is, it appears first here. So why, what's the point? So, um, what is what is what is his answer? What is Rabbi Yossi trying to say? Well, it sounds like because Abraham was so old when he had when he and Sarah had Isaac, people would doubt that it was really his son. So he's saying in this case, yeah, you know, we we had it before. His image is imprinted on Isaac. So anybody who sees him would say, yeah, there's no doubt about it. This is Abraham's son. Right, so if you that's the, the gist of, of note 14. You could read it just real quick, please. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, his image remains stamped in Isaac. Rabbi Levi said, on the day that Abraham weaned his son Isaac, he held a great feast. All the nations of the world mocked him saying, even if Sarah could give birth at the age of 90, could Abraham engender at the age of 100? Immediately, the features of Isaac's face changed and resembled Abraham's. They all exclaimed, Abraham engendered Isaac. Okay, so, uh, and it says we had this already before. Um, we're not going to go over the whole thing, but, but this idea that uh, God made it so that Isaac should look exactly like Abraham when he was a child, um, in order to protect the honor of Abraham and Sarah, and to say, look, this is, this is clear that this is their child, and specifically uh, in this very strange uh, patriarchal way of looking at it, that, that it's Abraham whose uh, um, paternity is at question, um, as opposed to that, say, oh, sure, Sarah could give birth at 90, but is, could it really be Abraham? Um, I don't know that we would ask such questions today. Um, but uh, nevertheless, that's the way the, the Midrash looks at it uh, in the Gemara. But that happened a long time ago, right? That happened um, many, many, many uh, decades before that Abraham's uh, image is stamped on Isaac. So how is it being brought up here, right? Rabbi Yossi says, why is it mentioned now? Because although it is written, God blessed Isaac, his son, now that Abraham had died, his image remained stamped in Isaac. So whoever saw Isaac would say, that's really Abraham. And would say Abraham engendered Isaac, which is the rest of our verse. So what is, what is how do you read this whole uh, set of, of uh, clauses? Because although it is written, God blessed Isaac, his son, now that Abraham died, his image remained stamped in Isaac. Apparently what he's saying is the image was stamped in Isaac from the get-go, right? From when he was a little baby, so that everybody should see that he's really Abraham's son. But now the question is, what happens once Abraham dies? What happens now? Now Abraham is no longer around. First of all, is there a need for Isaac to still look like Abraham? 
the implication is that Abra Isaac looked like Abraham all his life. What happens now when, when the old geezer is dead? What happens when the old man finally, you know, passes away? Where is Isaac now? Like where, where is, uh, you know, that, that possibility for a, a person who literally doesn't even have his own visage. He, he carries his father's looks for his whole life. He's in, so he's, he's in, he's in Abraham's shadow his whole life. Um, now Abraham is dead. So where where is Isaac now? What kind of uh, um, identity does he have? What kind of uh, uh, appearance does he put forward in the world? And the answer is, he yeah. can't escape Abraham ever. Even after his uh, father dies, his appearance has been stamped permanently to be a copy of Abraham. He's the spitting image of his father. And even when the father is no longer around to be compared to him, and even when his honor, Abraham's honor, is no longer something that Abraham needs to be concerned about, Isaac is stuck with this, with this uh, um, identity, with this set of features. Um, how do we read? Because although it is written, God blessed Isaac, his son, now his image remained stamped, uh, Abraham's eyes, uh, image remained stamped in Isaac. How do we, what's the connection between the because although, blah, 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 and then punchline, Abraham's image is permanently stamped upon Isaac. So Isaac, even now, after Abraham's death, every of him is saying, oh, there goes Abraham's son. There he is. So how does that relate to the first part of this of this sentence? It sounds like the visual aspect of the covenant to me. What do you mean? Well, he's stamped somewhere else, you know, that's not visible. Okay. So how does that relate to the first to the first part? How does that relate to that to that whole clause? Because although it is written, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm almost I'm there. almost reading it like even though even though to God you know God recognizes Isaac as a special person, nobody else does. He's almost a non-entity. It's not they're not even saying. Oh, look, there goes uh, the son of Abraham. Wow, he looks just like Abraham. They're saying he is Abraham. It's like, you know, Isaac, yeah, you died uh, you know, yonder at the Akeda years ago. You're really Abraham. So, and where does God's blessing come in? What, come back to what you were saying a minute ago. I'm, so how does God... I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, that, God, that God is recognizing Isaac as Isaac, right? That's what you were saying. Right. Everybody yeah. else sort of dismisses Isaac as as completely, you know, absorbed into Abraham. Right. But God doesn't. Right. That's what you're saying. Yeah. OK, good. I think that's a good reading. Um, the first way of reading it is in the most simple way possible, even though it does say God blessed Isaac, his son. But it never says Isaac, the son of Abraham. So how come now it's Isaac, the son of Abraham? So it's just a literary, uh, um, you know, feature that that the that the uh, uh, that the Zohar is saying that Rabbi Yossi is saying. Yes, it's true that Isaac is 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 announced to be Abraham's son just a, a few verses ago, but this is the first time that it actually says son of Abraham because. So then all of this business about God actually is irrelevant. It's just a phrase. From his son, it's now being made explicit into Abraham's son. But your point is, no, God is not irrelevant. God's blessing of Isaac is actually very relevant as an although. It's the counterbalance, like you say, of, of, uh, of Isaac's identity, right? That Isaac is not simply a pale reflection of his father. That Isaac is not simply, you know, so much of, of what we say, oh, he's just this like really uninteresting guy. Uh, who uh, is is just a placeholder until we finally get to uh, to Jacob and and uh, and the drama, right? 
No, there's actually a an encounter between God and Isaac, which is an encounter of blessing. God blessed Isaac. But even though God blesses Isaac, everybody else is saying, whenever they see him, that's really Abraham. Right? Um, all right, that's one possibility. Um, it might be possible... Um, well, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Good. All right. Let's let's continue. One night, Rabbi Yitzchak rose to engage in Torah. At the same moment, Rabbi Yehuda rose in his Caesarean castle. He said, I will go to Rabbi Yitzchak's house and engage in Torah so we can join as one. His young son, Hizkiah, accompanied him. Okay, so this is the beginning of a of a story, not a walking story, but a story of the encounter of of two uh, of the companions, two of the associates of the Chevraya, disciples of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, they're encountering each other. They're going to learn Torah together, um, and we have them in two separate places. One of them, we don't know where he is exactly, but he's getting up to study Torah. The uh, assumption that we make from other stories like this is that when when is this happening at midnight at midnight presumably right so that's that's the the, the traditional practice of the hevraya to make it a point to get up in the middle of the night in order to be able to unite with the the divine dynamic that's happening at that at that moment uh, up in heaven with the with the righteous other people the other the other souls and with and with the the two lovers so Rabbi Yitzchak is getting up to study Torah at that same moment Rabbi Yehuda also got up and he is in his Caesarean castle right? a Caesarean castle is a castle that is not born naturally but it has to be uh, <laughs> good I'm glad somebody's laughing. Good, even if you're on mute. So, uh, um, so uh, this is a, a you know a, 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 a speculative translation, some kind of uh, special place. If you look at the note, the word in Aramaic seems to be associated with the word Caesarea, which is uh, uh, you know Caesarea. Um, it has to. It's understood to be some special heichal, some kind of special palace or, or castle, which is pretty intriguing in and of itself. That Rabbi Yehuda had such an elaborate uh, place to be, um, but what we what do we hear him doing? He doesn't stay in his castle to study Torah in the in the middle of the night. He knows that he's in the vicinity where Rabbi, Yehuda, Rabbi Yitzchak is. So Rabbi Yehuda goes and decides, I want to join with my chaver. I want to join with my with my friend and study t- Torah with him. And we have this little narrative detail that there's a son that follows along. And of course, um, that's part of what we're talking about here. We're talking about fathers and sons. We're talking about Isaac, um, the son of Abraham. So um, let's see how these details um, might, uh, might, might play out in the, in the overall uh, discussion. Go ahead. As he approached his door, he heard Rabbi Yitzchak saying, After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac his son, and Isaac dwelled by the well Lahai Roy. Lahai Roi. Roi, Lahai Roi. The heir of Lahai Roi. Right? So the well of Lahai Roi. So that verse was just cited partially, uh, you know, a few lines before, even though God blessed Isaac, etc., etc. Now we have the full verse. The full verse comes at the end of Chaye Sarah, the previous Torah reading, and it gives us um, the the kind of wrapping up of what happens. Uh, Abraham dies. God blesses Isaac, his son, Abraham's son, and Isaac dwelled um, im be'er lachai roi, right? By Yeshiv Yitzchak im be'er lachai roi. So that's all. This this verse, so that's the verse that we're about to start unpacking. But I just want to, for a second, pause to notice the kind of literary finesse 
that is being uh, uh, applied by by our Zoharic uh, uh, storyteller, right? That this is happening. Rabbi, Yit, Rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak is learning all by himself, right? He's already started learning because Rabbi Yehuda had to first get up and had to leave his place and had to trudge over to where Rabbi Yossi, where, where Rabbi Yitzchak was. So Rabbi Yitzchak, they at the same time they get up at the same time. And then one of them is already starting to study in their place, and the other one leaves their place and has to go someplace else to, to study. And as they come to that special place where they want to go study, because that's where their friend is, who they who they want to study with, they overhear the words of Torah. They overhear Rabbi Yitzchak learning out loud, right? And Rabbi, Yitz, Rabbi Yitzchak is not talking to anybody, right? He's just simply learning the words of Torah um, in, uh, audibly, this is a very traditional idea, right? When we read uh, our books, most of the time we don't read out loud, right? Some of us may move our lips, but in general, what's considered good form today is you read silently, you know, and you immerse yourself in your book. Hopefully, you're paying attention to what you're reading. Um, and and reading is a silent activity. If you read out loud, it's usually because you're reading to somebody else, right? Um, but traditionally speaking, all the way back to the times of the sages, they asked people to learn out loud, even if you were only by yourself, even if you weren't studying with a Torah partner or in a group like we're in now. Whenever you were supposed to be reading, you were supposed to be singing out the text. You were supposed to be chanting the text. You were supposed to be saying out, out loud. When we on, 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 on this, at the Seder, um, if we still retain that traditional tune where we go, right now other, we have other tunes, which is all very fine. It's wonderful. But that, that chant, that's the learning uh, tune. That's the learning chant. Um, so that's um, that's that's a, a traditional way of of uh, of reading out the words. You didn't read the words. You read it with that kind of sing song. Um, there's there's all kinds of chazanus that that incorporates that kind of like uh, uh, learning. Uh, sing songy chant. Um, so there's a, there's a, a beautiful one. Hey, Ludovorim Shain Lahem Shiur, Apeyo, Rabikurim, Viorayo. So it's a musically adapted, um, uh, uh, treatment of Hey, Ludovorim Shain Lahem Shiur, Apeyo, Rabikurim, Viorayo, Milus Hasodim. So you chanted out the words because the Torah is a song. Right, the Torah is called a song um, at the end of Deuteronomy, and they were uh, uh, convinced that that kind of chanting made the words penetrate a little more deeply into your soul, into your consciousness, and that's what Rabbi Yitzchok is doing. And Rabbi Yehuda is overhearing this from the other side of the door. It's a very romantic image. This goes back to the Song of Songs, right? When we have the Song of Songs, we have my lover is on the other side of the door and my, so my lover is calling out to me from the other, open the door for me, open the door for me. And we have this, you know, this beautiful, you know, back and forth, the hesitation and the yearning and the, and the passion. Um, so here we have it transferred into a, into a, a yearning, you know, Rabbi Yehuda yearns to be with 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 Rabbi Yossi, with with, with Rabbi Yitzchak. His, you know, to somebody to study with. Um, there's a there's an erotics of Torah study. Um, that's that's subtly being uh, uh, you know laid out here. So he overhears Rabbi Yitzchak saying this. Um, so he quotes the verse, and he hears Rabbi Yitzchak continuing, saying the following: the beginning of this verse. Go ahead. Um, the beginning of this verse is inconsistent with its end and its end with its beginning. Why, in this case, did the Blessed Holy One have to bless Isaac? 
because Abraham didn't bless him. Why? So that Esau would not be blessed. Consequently, he consigned those blessings to the Blessed Holy One, as they have established. Ah. So now we have a different take on this whole relationship between Abraham and Abraham's death and Isaac after Abraham has died. Right? On the previous page, the last paragraph, we have this idea that God's blessing Isaac um, despite the fact that Isaac is Abraham's son and Abraham, uh, but Abraham's image is still stamped on Isaac, right? So we have that sense of connection, even that sense of, of, of uh, subsumption, right? Abraham subsumes Isaac within him. But here we have a very different uh, image. We have a, an, an image of, 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 uh, of cutting off. We have an image of separation. Right? Why Rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak begins by saying, what kind of run-on sentence is this? What's the beginning have to do with the end? What's the end have to do with the beginning? What's the, the, the beginning with the middle? The middle, you know, what, what's going on here? There's three different parts to this sentence. God, Abraham died. God blesses Isaac. Isaac lives, uh, you know, sets up uh, his, his dwelling place um, at this place called Be'er Lachai Rawi. Why is this all in one verse? What does one part of the verse have to do with the other part of the verse? So he starts reading it and he says, the death of Abraham is the cause of God blessing Isaac. Isaac needs a blessing because Abraham never blessed Isaac. Okay, now let's uh, 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 understand that blessing um, becomes a big deal, right? The whole the whole uh, uh, parsha with with Toldot is going to be filled up with this, you know, very very sticky drama of Isaac blessing Jacob, right? And Esav wants the blessing, and they're all fighting over the blessing. They know that there's a blessing to be given. So when you start thinking about that ret retroactively, you start going, well, where was the drama with the blessing with Isaac? Well, where is the blessing? Where's the blessing scene? We have a blessing scene later on too. When Jacob is right about to die, he gives a blessing to all of his to all of his children, to all of his sons. So we've got blessings from Isaac to Jacob, from Jacob to the 12 tribes. Where's the blessing from Abraham to Isaac? I mean, after all, that's the whole point of this passing on the blessing. Abraham is the first one to get the blessing, and that's the blessing that needs to be transmitted. So where did Abraham do it? So according to this, he didn't. According to this interpretation, he actually did not, either he decided not to or he couldn't um, or, or it, it just didn't happen. Abraham did not bless Isaac. So Isaac, when Abraham dies, we have two images now. One is, Isaac is stamped with Abraham's image. On the other hand, Isaac is totally bereft of the blessing. Whatever hope he had of getting the blessing has now disappeared. He's not getting the blessing. The only thing that Abraham did was chase away everybody, right? He chased away Ishmael long ago. And then later on, when he has these other children running around the house with Keturah, he sends them away, right? But where is the positive connection where Abraham doesn't just eliminate all the competition, but where Abraham actually then gives Isaac the blessing? It's not here. So um, what's, what's the answer? So, so he gives an answer. Why? So that Esav would not be blessed. Okay, let's look at note 17. Why? So that Esau would not be blessed. If Abraham had blessed Isaac, the blessing would have extended to both of Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau. So how do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of that? Mm 
claim here is that had Abraham actually given this, bestowed the blessing to Isaac, then Isaac would have been the vessel to pass the blessing along. And Isaac would have had no choice but to convey the blessing to both of his children. Because both Esau and Jacob are equally his children. How is that different from Isaac and Ishmael? How is that different from Isaac and all of the uh, the children, so to speak, of Keturah? Only Isaac is from Sarah. Correct. <clears throat> right. Only Isaac is the child of both parents of the of that special uh, conjunction, that special union of the patriarch and the matriarch. Right. So so Ishmael being eliminated is no problem. But with Esav and Yaakov, we've got this real uh, uh, total, these are twins. These are two children fighting within the womb of their same mother, right? So this is the, the, uh, uh, the, the conflict in, in more ways than one. This goes back to our uh, previous page, that sort of ending teaching how do we, you know, how do we factor out Jacob and Esau? Right? How do we, how do we account for them, and and how do we see their relationship? In the one way, they're totally connected. Right. On the, in another way, we want to differentiate them completely. Isaac uh, is is uh, going to somehow. Uh, give over the blessing only to Jacob and not to Esau because Esau is the demonic. But at the same time, Esau and Yaakov come from the same source. That's what we were struggling with last time. And now we have the idea that Isaac is Abraham's copy, Abraham's duplicate. Right, and if he passes on the blessing to his child, it will go to both. So what we have is this very, very strange uh, uh, working. God blesses Abraham, and then Abraham has to not pass that blessing on to Isaac. God has to re-bless Isaac, but when God re-blesses Isaac, God is re-blessing Abraham. Because Isaac is Abraham. So the continuity that will happen soon is going to be uh, maintained. But it's going to be maintained from the divine source of blessing rather than the human source of blessing. So again, it begs the question. If God blesses Isaac, then Esau doesn't get a blessing. But if Abraham blesses Isaac, then Esau does get a blessing. What's the difference? If Isaac gets blessed... Doesn't the blessing then flow through him to his children? Once Isaac is blessed, doesn't it? Doesn't it, ha it has to flow through, right? That's what, that was the whole claim. So, first of all, we should understand that Abraham lived to see Jacob and Esau uh, into their youth, right? When, when we have the famous uh, story soon in, in Toldot of the, the, the bowl of, of, of pottage, right? The lentil soup, whatever it's called, uh, the Nezid Adashim, um, the, uh, 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 the scene is that Jacob is cooking up this pot of lentil soup and Esau comes from the field and he's famished and he says, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying of, of hunger. Give me some of that stuff and the whole thing. Um, according to the, the, the chronology developed by the rabbis, that day was the day that Abraham died. And the Nezid Adashim, the lentil soup, was food for mourners. Right? That, that uh, Jacob was preparing a shiva meal. So um, Abraham lived to see his grandsons. He lived to see his grandchildren. And that means that before he died, he already saw Isaac as the father of both Esau and Yaakov. 
And then the question is, maybe it means here that Abraham couldn't bring himself to bless Isaac, you know, from the lens of the, of the sages, if Abraham sees Esau as being unworthy, then Abraham is stuck in a quandary. And his blessing, he, he withdraws or he withholds his blessing because he can't see how this blessing will then be able to be taken over later um, uh, by, by, by somebody as, as unworthy as Esau. So what has to happen? There has to be a blessing given by God. God can do this. Abraham couldn't make himself do it. Abraham couldn't allow himself to, to bestow the blessing. But God is Baruch. God is abounding in blessings. So God gives over the blessing. So in other words, that Esau wasn't going to get the blessing is a foregone conclusion. But not to Abraham. To God, yes. But not to Abraham. Abraham couldn't yet uh, uh, reconcile himself to the fact that Esau, who seemed to be the, the firstborn, that Esau would be somehow eliminated. So he couldn't uh, uh, bestow that blessing. He withholds it, but God does not withhold it. God does not withhold it. So, again, Yitzchak is found in, a, uh, in the middle right? He, he loses the blessing that he needed from Abraham and he sees a son who he has uh, some uh, mixed feelings about. He loves Esau, but on the other hand, he's not getting the blessing because of Esau. And then God comes in and blesses him nevertheless. Nevertheless. Um, by the way, who is teaching this teaching? Rabbi Yitzchak. Yeah, coincidence? I don't know. Uh, All right. So, um, so this is this is, and this is all happening in a soliloquy, right? This is a monologue. This is Rabbi Yitzchak talking to himself. He's working this stuff out. He's not explaining it to anybody. He doesn't know that Rabbi Yehuda is listening at the door. Right? So he's just saying it um, to work out his own understanding. Okay. There are a few. There, there are, there are, I'm looking for more rhymes and clues. I mean, to me, L'chai um, Roi and Kafel Roi sound like they might rhyme i'm just waiting to see what else comes up in the story that might rhyme <laughs> besides rav yitzchak and yitzchak so all right let's see let's see if we find any excuse me so, yeah rich but god's blessing does not um flow to asa apparently not okay apparently not i mean that's it's it's i mean look we know the story so the story is that yitzchak is able to then pour the entire blessing into Yaakov. And that's Esau's big complaint. What, you only have one blessing? It's all being used up by, by Yaakov? I don't get anything? And then Yitzchak has to give Esau a different blessing. Not the same blessing. They can't share the blessing. But that's why I'm saying that possibly what we have here is, is Abraham not being able to imagine that if he gives the blessing that it would be somehow fair or possible to exclude Esau, right? Once, once it's, and it, therefore he gives up. But God says, no, it'll be, it'll work out. Now it works out in a very tragic way. And maybe that's another uh, part of, of Abraham's uh, uh, hesitation or Abraham's restraint, right? That he doesn't want that kind of, uh, um, really uh, distressing, uh, uh, you know, deception and double dealing uh, that, that ends up happening in order to get Esau out of the picture. He can't see how Esau could possibly be taken out of the picture. Now remember, um, made this point many, many times, Avraham 
loves everyone and everything endlessly. Right? Abraham is chesed, unmitigated, unbounded chesed. So we have here maybe another kind of akeda. Right? He is called upon by God to engage in these kinds of really challenging uh, moments where he's called upon to bind his son, right? To, to, to restrict his son, to do everything that's counter to what Abraham, as in, in his essence, is all about. And he does it. And that's where the Zohar, as we've talked about many, many times already, sees this fusion. Right, this this um, overcoming of the of the dichotomy between Chesed and Gvura, the infusing of the uh, I think that's I think the 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 uh, the teddy bear is falling asleep. That's the problem. The teddy the teddy bear is nodding is nodding out. So, uh, um, but the uh, um, the the uh, uh, test for Abraham creates the possibility of mixing uh, and melding uh, chesed and gvura, right? Love and uh, restraint and constriction and, and, and judgment and so on. Um, and that's going to be where, you know, Isaac is going to be another Abraham, right? When he, he's going to sacrifice one of his sons, right? He's going to, he's going to have to do a kind of an akeda also. But now we see that there's this other place where Abraham is not willing to sacrifice one of the sons, the grandchildren. And therefore, he can't bring himself to bring to give out the blessing. So in that sense, it's a paradox because that's what he wants to do. That's his natural uh, essence, to give forth the blessing, to give the blessing over. But he is, he is uh, um, cognizant that if he does that, then it's going to somebody who's not worthy. Then he doesn't want to bless the, 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 the demonic, right, from the Zohar's point of view. So, but God will work it out, right? God will work it out so that the blessing will go um, to Jacob and not to Asaph. Okay. Um, and that's the last line. Consequently, he consigned those blessings to the Blessed Holy One. As the, so Abraham says it's in God's hands. In a certain sense, taking that phrase, it reminds me, all the way at the beginning, when God says to Abraham, Lech Lecha, get moving, he says the point is, bracha, be a blessing. Rashi says, Kol nitunot biadecha. All the blessings are placed in your hands. And here we have Abraham sort of relinquishing it back to God and goes, you know, in this case, I can't do it. I can't do it. You do it. So Abraham gives over the blessings back to the Blessed Holy One, and God gives the blessing to Isaac. Um, okay. Um, as a side point, how does Isaac feel about all of this? It has, how does Isaac process this um, this kind of mixed message, right? On the one hand, his father has made sure that he alone will be his rightful heir. He alone will, will take over the entire uh, family business. All the other children are sent away with gifts, and everything else is all now Isaac's. So on the one hand, he's getting a confirmation and, and an affirmation from his father. On the other hand, the one thing that really counts, he doesn't get. Comes along God and gives Isaac what Isaac has been hoping for and, and missing. Right? So now what does it mean that Yitzchak, that Isaac, dwelled in that place? What does that have to do with, the, with this whole drama, with this whole uh, uh, stress and strain about the blessing? How does this fit in? Why is this all part of one verse? So we're up to the next uh, uh, paragraph. Isaac dwelled by the well Lechai Roi. What does Lechai Roi mean? That he joined Shechina, a well upon which appeared the angel of covenant, 
as the verse is translated. Therefore, he blessed him. Okay. So, um, the, the, the end of the verse tells us not that some kind of geographical thing, and we'll, we'll come back to what we have often noticed about what that verse seems to be saying. But at this point, according to the Zohar, um, it's not, it's not a, a place name, but it is about Isaac's uh, devotion and his uh, uh, spiritual uh, clinging, excuse me, I'm getting a hiccups here, to the Shechina. So Shechina is the Be'er. The Be'er is the well. Right, and the well we've had many, many times already. This is the place where all the waters get collected. All of the forces of life, all of the of the blessings, are all collected from the well, and then the well is the source that can then be uh, uh, where you can take the blessings out of the well. So that's shechina. So that's the well, and then lachai roi. Okay, um, let's look at verse at uh, note nineteen. The high roi upon which appeared the angel of covenant. The word roi derives from the root resh alef he to see, and implies a manifestation of shechina. She is the angel of covenant who joins with Yisod, the divine phallus known as covenant. Okay. Uh, the translation referred to is Targum Onkelos, which reads here, the well upon which appeared the angel of covenant. Right. So I want to just get that for a second. So that's at the end of Chaye Sarah, uh, chapter 25, verse 11. Right. So the. Uh, um, the translation in the in the Targum Unculus is, and after Abraham uh, died, then God blessed Yitzchak, his son, and Yitzchak dwelled with the well, the Malach Kayama Yitchazayale, where the angel of the covenant had appeared over it. Right, so. At that well, where the angel of the covenant had appeared, what is the Targum Unculus uh, referring to? Where did we encounter this Be'er Lachai Roi before? In the story of the saving of Yishmael, when Yishmael is a is is a little baby. I'm um, actually. I don't, I'm, I, hold on a second. That's actually because I always mix up the two stories. So. Um, we have two expulsion stories with Hagar, right? So the first one, um, so the first one is back here. Sorry, back in Lech Lecha. Okay. And we have it. Sorry. Yeah. So it's in uh, chapter 16. And we have the verses, uh, um, so Abraham is, 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 uh, is scolded by Sarai. He's, he's called Abram still. And he says, here's your, here's your maidservant, do whatever you want. Right? So Sarai vativrach mi So Sarai, uh, Sarai uh, afflicts, uh, um, harasses, tortures, um, uh, Hagar, right? And uh, this is after Hagar has been sort of uppity toward her toward her mistress, and uh, she runs away. Vativrachmi panea, she runs away. Vayimtsaa malach Hashem, and an angel of the Eternal 
finds her al ein hamayim bamidbar at a at a spring of water, a fountain of water. Al ha'ayin bederach shur on the uh, where the fountain on the on the on the road to shur, and he says Hagar, maiden uh, maid servant of Sarai, where are you coming from? Where are you going? She says I'm running away from my from my mistress. So the angel says, go back to your mistress, tolerate everything that she does to you. And then he says, but remember, I will, it's all going to be worth it because your children will be so multiplied that uh, they won't be able to be counted. There'll be so many of them. And then he says, This is an annunciation scene. We haven't had one yet for Sarah. But this is the annunciation for ha for Hagar. You are pregnant, or you soon will be pregnant, and you will have a son. God has taken notice of your affliction. God knows that you're suffering, and God has heard. So call him Yishmael. He'll be a wild guy. He'll be mixing it up with everybody all the time. But he will spread out. He will be a uh, flourish. So then Hagar calls out and says, Oh, you are the God who has seen me. Right? Right? So have I been able from going so far to see anything after uh, God is has seen me? This will be able to, to keep me going. And therefore the well was called Be'er, the well of Lachai, the living one, that means God, who sees me, right? Who sees me and who has heard me. So we're not going to go into uh, all of the unpacking of that. But Be'er Lachai Ro'i is given its name in the story by Hagar in gratitude to encountering God's angel who uh, uh, appears to her and promises her that she's going to be okay and that her son is going to be not only okay but but uh, a big success in the world. That's Be'er Lachai Ro'i. So when we now have Yitzchak going to dwell in Be'er Lachai Ro'i, We've talked about this any number of times when we've been in shul. Um, the implication is that he's coming back to a place that is intimately tied to Yishmael's story. This is a a, a place that, in Yishmael's uh, family, uh, uh, you know, histories, the chronicles of the family of Yishmael. This is a major place for Yishmael. This is where Yishmael will tell his great grandchildren. Ah, oh, you know, I was, I was, you know, uh, hardly even a, a born yet, and I and my mother almost died of thirst, and then God appeared and 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 saved the day. So this is Be'er Lachai Roi. So it's a place that is tied up with the expelled son, the rejected son, Yishmael, and Isaac goes there. So. The implications of of what Isaac's relationship is with his expelled brother, um, you know, don't have to be drawn out more than they've already been. There's a there's a sense that that's maybe a, some kind of reunification that goes on. We know that Yishmael came to bury Abraham, so there's been some ongoing connection. But now what the Zohar does is they say, no, 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 this is, has nothing to do with Yishmael. This has nothing to do with a reconciliation. Or a reunion between Yitzchak and and his brother, um, from the Zohar's point of view, almost God forbid. Rather, Be'er Lachai Roi is Yitzchak's own personal religious attainment of dveikut, of connection, of bonding with Shechina, the Be'er, who herself is dedicated to Malach. Ha, uh, habrit, right? Malcha, Malacha de, de Kiyama, right? The the angel of the covenant. The covenant means the bris, and the bris. Uh, somebody mentioned before, right? The stamp that that uh, is on uh, uh, Isaac but is not seen. That bris 
is part of shechin, of 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 the divine uh, array as well. That's yesod, right? That's the um, the uh, uh, the phallus the, uh, of of the divine. So the union of shechina with yesod, her looking toward with yearning to her lover is now Yitzchak's own yearning and love. Yitzchak binds himself to the loving couple of Shechina and Yesod. Right? So that's what it means. He dwells in Be'er Lachairoi, in the Shechina, as she looks with love and yearning to her lover, which is Lachai, to the living one. Who is the is is Yisod, um, or or her lover, the the male lover? So this is um, uh, what Yitzchak has attained, and then what does the end of this paragraph say? Therefore, he blessed him. So let's take that into account now. Why is Yitzchak blessed? Until now, we've been developing this whole theory that he has to get Abraham's blessing. Abraham is not up to it, or Abraham is not capable of it, or there's some other obstacle. And then when Abraham dies, God has to step in. Rabbi. Now, we found out something else. What's the approach that's being, that's being uh, uh, shown to us now? Why is it that, a that Yitzchak gets this blessing from God? Rabbi? Yes. Could what, could an obstacle be that Abraham is a convert? No. Okay. There is there's, that we've had. We have too many, too many long, long, long discussions about Abraham, and Abraham's pursuit of God. But that's but Abraham's pursuit of God is is relevant here. What what is the the source of the blessing that God? What's the what's the the, the trigger, or what's the motivating factor? What's the activator that makes God give Yitzchak the blessing? What we have here, according to this, is Yitzchak doesn't get the blessing because he's Abraham's son, at least not in a biological way. Yitzchak gets the blessing because of Yitzchak's own spiritual quest. Because Yitzchak dwelled with Shechina in her loving yearning and, and desire for her divine lover, because he was so enamored, because he was so devoted to the divine love story, therefore, says Rabbi Yitzchak, therefore he blessed him. That's why he got the blessing. He didn't get the blessing because he inherited it as Abraham's son. He got the blessing on his own merits. He got the blessing, if anything, like I, in, like I was about to say, he got the blessing because he has recapitulated Abraham's own self-invention. The Zohar spends many, many, many pages celebrating the fact that Abraham brings himself to seeking God and the whole process of, of his growth. Now what we have is that Rabbi Yitzchak is saying in a, in a miniature way, um, we don't have a whole fully blown uh, uh, biblical treatment of it and not even a Zoharic treatment that much, but that's what Yitzchak now does. Yitzchak has done this on, you know, on his own steam. And therefore, he merits the same blessing, just like God blessed Abraham, because Abraham was a God seeker. God blesses Isaac because Isaac is a God seeker, not because he's Abraham's son. That's a pretty important uh, 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 you know, place to, to get to. Um, for for uh, for for a uh, an understanding of these relationships, um, does that save Isaac as an independent character in a certain sense? Right, that's been what's been hovering over a lot of what we've been looking at all night. Right, who is this Isaac guy in relation to Abraham? Yes, he's Abraham's son, but guess what? He's Abraham's son. Right, Abraham's son can be an erasure. Or Abraham's son can be a blessing. He inherited from Abraham, in some way, it's in his genes, to go seek out God. 
right? And then he did it. Now, that's where we shouldn't take it for granted. Of course, if he's Abraham's son, he's going to do it. Because guess what? Yishmael didn't do it. Right? So it's not automatic. Right? But it is um, to his great credit that he himself did this. And therefore, he gets this bracha from God. Okay. Any comments at this to, to this point? And the thing that he did was to settle near this. Settling means spiritual devotion. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a physical act. What it is is he planted himself emotionally, spiritually, cognitively, in every kind of way. He planted himself in that love story of God within God's own self. Shechina seeking out her 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 partner right the be'er roi looking toward the chai right he, that was his obsession that's the, the yoshev that's the yoshev and the use of the word im is not that common is it is it no very good good so that you know we would think be right or eight yeah. so or something like that im is with absolutely yes. Conjunction. Very good. Yeah. 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 So, so that's the point. Um, let's, let's go to the next uh, uh, sentence. Meanwhile, next Rabbi, two sentences. meanwhile, Rabbi Yehuda knocked on the door and entered and they joined together. Rabbi Yitzchak said, now coupling of Shechina consorts with us. Okay. So we have a little break in the in the uh, exegesis of the verses and talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and 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 God, and we have again like a shift of, of focus into this little narrative uh, uh, moment. So so is this just simply a, a uh, you know a diversion? Um, that's where you know that's where uh, you know there, there's there's some things to think about and and part of what I try to you know work out in my own book um, but what what's what's going on here what what is this little moment how is this story you know constructed in this way right what 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 the uh, what Rabbi Yitzchak says is now the coupling of Shechina, uh, uh now coupling of Shechina consorts with us Right, the un uniting with Shechina um, is is now part of what we ourselves are doing. Um, this literally is what he was just working out was Yitzchak's great attainment. Right, that's what Yitzchak was. Why he got the blessing? He got the blessing because Yitzchak ran after Shechina was in love with Shechina, with Shechina's love, right? Um, so this is, um, you know, his exegesis. And then, right at that point, just by coincidence, that's exactly when Rabbi Yehuda comes to join with him, right? And then what Rabbi, what Rabbi Yitzchak says back is, oh, you're joining with me, and now that means that if we join together, Shechina joins with us. Right, so we have a threesome, right? Which is exactly what 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 Yitzchak himself had. Yitzchak was a threesome with Shechina and her lover, right? And now they are a threesome, the two of them, with Shechina as their lover, right? So there's the upper, the 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 human joining the divine love couple. And now there's the divine joining the human love couple, right? And it's all through Torah. Okay. Good. Rabbi Yehuda said. Rabbi Yehuda said, what you said about the well lachai roi is well spoken, but that is implied by its very words. Go ahead. He Another in Yashikoach, that was very, I overheard what you said. You got you you did good, you said a good thing. Let me show you how what you said is actually already in the words themselves. Right? Let me nail it down a little bit more into the text. He opened. 
He opened, saying, A spring of gardens, a well of living waters flows from Lebanon. And the now, of course, now it comes right back in a, in, a, in a clear way. This is all Song of Songs, right? This has already been discussed, but they have established a spring of gardens, Abraham, a well of living waters, Isaac, flows, Jacob, a well of living waters, Isaac, as is written, Isaac dwelled by the well, Lachai Roi, precisely. The well, Shechina, Lachai, of the living one, Chai, life of, the world's righteous one, vitality of the world's, they are not to be separated. He lives in two worlds, above, upper world, and with the lower world, enduring, glowing through him. Okay. So... He says, you know, this is so clear. It comes right out of the text. Of course, what he says now becomes even more, uh, you know, uh, uh, abstruse than, than, than before. But the, the imagery now gets piled one on top of the other. Okay, so the verse is, Mayan ganim be'er mayim chayim yotzim or nozlim men alavanon. Right, that's the Song of Songs verse. So then he breaks it down. And he says, Mayan Ganim, this is Abraham. Abraham is the first source of all the living waters, right? That's why when you when uh, Rich, when he said he's a convert, this is not the way the way he's he's perceived. He's perceived as an origin. He's perceived as as he's not converting into anything, he's creating something. He's opening up the, the original sources of divine blessing. So a well of living waters then is the next patriarch, Yitzchak, right? But how is Yitzchak called a well? Because, of course, Yitzchak is gvura. Yitzchak is a container. Yitzchak is limitation. Yitzchak is receptacle. Yitzchak is, um, you know, constraining. So the spring that constantly flows, that's Abraham, right? The well is Isaac. Isaac is the recept the receptor of the uh, um, of the of the living waters, and then flows from Lebanon. That's Jacob, who then continues the flowing that was started by Abraham, because Jacob synthesizes Abraham and Isaac together. Right, so the flowing now can be done in the in the best possible way. So first of all, we're back to affirming this uh, uh, chain, this, this three-linked chain of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which was part of the uh, issue, again, back the previous page, about how we see each one of them, uh, you know, a, a necessary uh, step in, in the unfolding of, of, of the divine. Now we come back to Yitzchak. Why is Yitzchak, why is it appropriate for him to be called Be'er Mayim Chayim? So the answer is because of that verse, right? Vayeshev Yitzchak im Be'er Lachai Roi. So there you have the Be'er again, and you have the Chayim and the Chai mentioned again and again. So the Be'er is Shechina that we had already, right? And then Lachai, who is the Chai? Who is the living one? The Chai is the life of all worlds, the Tzaddik, the righteous one, right? The Tzaddik is Yisod. So that's the same thing as Chei HaOlamim, vitality of the worlds. That's a phrase that we use in our, in our Psuke de Zimra blessings. Um, and, uh, um, when we, and, and then they um, that are not to be separated. Right, that on the 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 shechina and yesod, who is the the reaching out of the of the male lover to shechina, can never be separated. Should not be separated from each other. And Yitzchak is joining with them. Right, Yitzchak has identified with them. Yitzchak has bonded with them. Who's the he? The he is the righteous one. He lives in two worlds. Right, the righteous one is the bridge the connector, above, upper world, and with the lower world, enduring, flowing through him. Right? This is the concept 
of the tzaddik yisod olam, that the word yisod means a foundation, because the not as a as a bottom bedrock foundation, but as a uh, um, the pillar that holds the world together, that unites the upper world with the lower world, so that they don't collapse on each other. That's what the yisod is. That's what the 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 concept of the righteous the righteousness of God, which is understood as a giving forward of God's love and God's life and God's light, right? That light is channeled from uh, above down into the lower world uh, and and uh, by means of, of Shekhinah uh, re receiving it and then dispensing it. So Yitzchak's role, Yitzchak's role is to be that intermediary well that then is able to uh, uh, um, contain the blessing and then pass it on and then unite with it. Okay, we're going to stop here and we'll continue, uh, God willing, next time. Uh, and Yeshakoach uh, to everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.